Sakaram Shruti Sarasam. This call is now being recorded. Samarasam Chidananda Karam Shruti Sarasasaram. Samarasam Niradharadharam Bhava Jaladhiparam Paragunam. Ramagrivaharam Vrajavanaviharam Haranutam Sadatam Govindam Paramasukhakandam Bhajatare Mahambodhisthanam Sthiracharanidanam Devijapam Sudhadhara Panam Vihagapatiyanam Yamaratam Manogyam Sukyanam Munijananidhanam Dhruvapadam Sadatam Govindam Paramasukhakandam Bhajatare Paresham Padmesham Shiva Kamala Jesham Shiva Karam Dvijesham Devesham Tanukutila Kesham Kaliharam Khagesham Nagesham Nikhila Bhuvanesham Nagadharam Sadatam Govindam Paramasukhakandam Bhajatare Sadatam Govindam Paramasukhakandam Bhajatare Sadatam Govindam Paramasukhakandam Bhajatare Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so today is our fourth lecture in the Saturday lecture series. Uh, as we know that, uh, sir, will you please, uh, anyone who is having unmuted uh, mic, sir. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so we are celebrating Teachers Day as the 5th of September. And 5th of September is not near the birthday celebration of a world frame philosopher or academician, but it also signifies that the torch of light carried with such distinction and grace uh, by famous teachers from Plato and Aristotle to Thomson and Rutherford, uh, from Guru Vashish to Dron and Sandeepni to Dr. Radha Krishnan has now been handed over to today's generation teachers to us. So it's our duty to provide the right type of leadership and education to convey our pupils their profound learning and wisdom by their humility, and most of all, moral convictions for following virtue and knowledge unafraid. So these are some basic questions. These are some dilemmas also in the present scenario uh, that we are going to discuss in uh, today's seminar, in the today's uh, discussion, and uh, in the light of Dr. Radhakrishnan's philosophy. Sir? So today we are having very learned and very experienced philosophers. Our today's program's uh, speaker, in fact, uh, we are having S. Panir is uh, Dr. S. Panir as our speaker. Uh, uh, Dr. M. V. Krishnaya, I hope he had also joined the meeting. Uh, he is present here as a, a guest of honor. And Dr. D. Gangadhar, sir, he is presiding the seminar. So for today's speaker, uh, Dr. Panir Selvam, I think that I won't be able to, uh, in fact, he doesn't need any introduction. But sir, uh, our students who are present here very eagerly, uh, uh, they are very new to the world of the philosophy. So I will have to introduce a bit, you know, I won't be able to read your entire biodata. That's not possible for me at all. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm just, uh, you know, how vast he's having, academically sound profile he's having. So I'm just reading. Uh, Professor Dr. S. Panir Selvam, presently member of Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi, and General Secretary of Indian Philosophical Congress, is former National Fellow, Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi, former chairperson, School of Philosophy and Religious Thought, and professor and head department of philosophy, University of Madras, 
has authored and edited 16 books and also published more than 85 research papers in the leading philosophical journals and anthologies at national and international levels. His book, The Problem of Meaning, with reference to Wittgenstein and Shankar, published by the University of Madras, is a comparative study of the East and the West on philosophy of language. And the two volumes, The Life World of the Tamils, Past and Present, Volume 1 and 2, as associate editor, were published by the Project of History, Indian Science, Philosophical and Culture, New Delhi, uh, through the MHRD. His recent edited volume as guest editor of Sadhan Journal on Issues and Challenges in Postmodernism was published by the Center for Studies and Civilization, New Delhi, functioning under MHRD, Government of India. His another recent co-edited volume on conflict resolution, uh, Perspectives from Indian Philosophy and Tradition is published by the University Kebang San Malaysia 2019. Uh, he has 35 years of postgraduate teaching and research experience. He has participated in more than 300 national and international conferences and seminars. He has visited Germany, Canada, Thailand, Japan, South Korea, Iran, China, Malaysia, Sri Lanka in connection with the international conferences and invited lectures. So of these countries, he has visited more than thrice for special lectures. He has organized nearly 50 national and international conferences and seminars as director and coordinator. Uh, he, was direct, uh, he was also dean Madras University and the editor of Madras University Journal, Humanity Section, and also the coordinator of the Center of Swami Vekanand for highest research and learning. This is the... Uh, you know, brief biodata of uh, Dr. S. Penir Selvam. Uh, so before any delay, now I would like to call upon our uh, head of the department, Professor Aran Mishra, uh, to welcome our honorable guests who are virtually present on the dais of the Department of Philosophy and Religion and uh, to ask Dr. Penir Selvam for his uh, lecture for enlightening of our students as well as the scholars who are present here. Sir, Professor Anand Mishra, our head of the department. Honorable Speaker, Professor S. Panir Silvamji, guest of honor, Samadharani M. B. Kishnaiyaji, Professor D. A. Gangadhar, chairing the seminar. Professor Sam Sivji, Professor Gopal Sahu, head of the department, Ilhavad University, Dr. Shruti Misra, winner of the seminar, Priyanka Ji, our colleagues, students, and learned scholars connected to the seminar. I welcome you all in this Saturday seminar. Friends, our seminar today is centered on philosophy of S. Radha Krishnan. And uh, we are fortunate that some of the best resource persons are here with us. I welcome them all. Our speaker today is Professor S. Panir Selvam. Dr. Suti has already given an introduction about him. Professor Selvam belongs to the great tradition of philosophy department of Madras University. As you know, the department of philosophy Madras University and our own department, department of philosophy and Banaras University, both of these departments were recognized as advanced study center in early 60s. There was a close connection between these two departments. 
our de department was headed by professor t r b murthy then department of philosophy madras university was headed by professor t m p mahadevan both these people were contemporary one was the great scholar of buddhism another was of advait vedanta and there was a close connection between these two departments of course the connecting link was professor s radha krishnan actually due to him both these departments got advanced study center professor radha krishnan was a connecting link between east and west between indian philosophy and western philosophy between philosophy and science between philosophy and religion more than 100 years back the challenge before professor radha krishnan was to establish indian philosophy as a philosophy proper in fact there were some scholars from the west who were of the view that indian philosophy is not a philosophy proper it is just like religion though the situation due to efforts of radha krishnan and other scholars the situation has changed but the challenge is almost similar even now why because beginning from ram mohan rai to loiya jayaprakash or sampurnanand or beginning from kc bhattacharya to jaya krishna we have a galaxy of contemporary indian philosophers but unfortunately neither indian philosophers nor indian students take them seriously you will be surprised to know them that when we thought about organizing the seminar on radha krishnan we could not get more than five persons who could be expert of radha krishnan's philosophy so that's why i think it would be very relevant today to remember radha krishnan professor m b krishnaiya is guest of honor today he is a professor of he was a professor at andhra university he was a close friend of professor r pandey and professor kamlakar misra and both of these people used to recognize two people from sub M B Krishnaiya and R Bala Krish R Bala Bala Subramaniam as son. My Guruji Professor Pandey always used to say that these are son; they are the saint-like people. So I welcome you, sir, in this Saturday seminar. I also welcome Professor D A Gangadhar Ji. It is his own department. in spite of his health problem he accepted our invitation to preside over the seminar i welcome you sir i also welcome professor gopal sahu the head of the department of philosophy elahabad university 
राम शिव जी प्रोफेसर अंबिका दत्त शर्मा जी प्रोफेसर देवव्रत चौबे जी प्रोफेसर मुकुललाल मेहता जी एंड अदर ग्रेट अदर स्कॉलर्स लर्निड स्कॉलर्स हु आर कनेक्टेड टू द सेमिनार आई वेलकम ऑल द स्टूडेंट्स स्कॉलर्स हु आर कनेक्टेड टू द सेमिनार I welcome once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, without any delay, uh, I would like to call upon our today's seminar's speaker, Dr. Panir Selvam, sir, to deliver his lecture for our students, for all the scholars as well as who are present here to listen to you very eagerly, sir. Uh, paneer sir kindly unmute yourself uh, uh most respected uh, professor anand mishra ji today guest of honor professor krishnaya ji and uh, today's uh, chairman of the session professor b a gangadhar ji professor sambhu prasad ji professor ranjit goshi professor tiwari ji professor jada shankar ji who may always uh, call as uh, my guru professor ambika datta ji professor chandrika ji professor avinash ji professor gopal sahu professor mulkraj professor shri vyas professor pande and many other scholars Professor Badri and many other scholars who have joined this session. <clears throat> and I am grateful to all of you for uh, joining this uh, very important uh, uh, session. This session is very important for the main reason that uh, on the eve of uh, Teachers' Day we have gathered. in fact uh, the saturday seminars which professor anand mishra ji has been arranging is really thought provoking and stimulating i should say and i always believe that under his dynamic leadership the department will reach its heights in fact uh, the bhu philosophy department has a very rich tradition very nicely professor anand mishra ji has pointed out how our department that is madras university center for advanced study in philosophy and bhd philosophy department they have been coordinating for various programs and that uh, relation is something remarkable because uh, i remember professor t r v murthy visiting our department and uh, similarly our professor uh, kb mahadevan used to say that he had visited bhu for some meeting or other so the interaction between these two department is something very well known in academic circle so i i am grateful to professor anand mishra ji for giving me a chance to speak in this uh, great uh, department whom i always admire now what i am going to do in my uh, talk is to discuss the philosophical journey of uh, professor radhakrishnan and also to situate dr radhakrishnan in the philosophical uh, discourse this is very important for the main reason that uh, quite often many of our contemporary thinkers were not uh, given their due in fact very beautifully uh, it was pointed out by anand mishra ji how some of our thinkers have not been taken seriously by the west and i always admire the way in which anand mishra ji speaks he could successfully show 
that how in contemporary philosophical indian philosophical discourse is something very important so now let me very briefly talk to you about uh, the philosophical journey of uh, dr raga krishnan when dr raga krishnan was made as the president of india philosopher batten russell wrote like this i quote it is an honor to philosophy that dr raga krishnan should be the president of india i that is batten russell as a philosopher take special pressure on this plato aspired for philosophers to become kings and it is a tribute to india that she should make a philosopher our president and coach this is what uh, batten russell wrote when radha krishnan became the president of india a radha krishnan professor radha krishnan who lived between 1888 to 1975 was a very distinguished personality of our country both in academic as well as in public life he has combined as very rightly pointed out by anand mishra ji professor radha krishnan could combine both east and west in all his writings and his uh, approach to the universal philosophy is something remarkable in the history of philosophy and his interpretation of prasanna traya is something unique and proved that uh, he can be considered as an acharya of modern time and he received universal fame by writing the two volumes of indian philosophy and one of the contributions uh, of radha krishnan is uh, that distinction he made between intellect and intuition intellect and intuition and uh, his approach to religious experience or mystical experience explain the revival of uh, faith in religion and he firmly believed that intellect gives us uh, only superficial knowledge of reality whereas intuition reveals the truth so intuition according to him is always complete by itself and it is integral to knowledge so it is he felt that intuition is a synthesis between sense and reason in fact he says i quote him intuitive knowledge arises from an intimate fusion of mind with reality it is the awareness of the truth of things by identity we become one with the truth one with the object of knowledge the object is seen not as an object outside the self but as part of the self unquote born on september 5th 1988 at tirthani he studied uh, ba in uris college and later joined madras christian college tambaram for his uh, ba honors and ma and it is very interesting to note how he has chosen philosophy his uh, cousin one of his cousin passed uh, him three important books world books one is uh, stout's uh, psychology then welton's uh, logic book and then mackenzie's ethics so he passed this book to books to radha krishnan and radha krishnan read this books and he was fascinated by uh, philosophy, uh, uh, philosophy that's how radha krishnan chose to uh, do philosophy as a main subject and uh, one important thing uh, thing happened here that is his encounters with the christian missionaries both at uris college and at madras college shaped him and his thought what is that his teacher in madras christian college uh, he had uh, the teacher professor a g hog 
A.G. Hogg uh, was a direct student of uh, Pringle Patterson, and uh, A.G. Hogg used to make a comparative study between Hinduism and Christianity, and he believed, of course, wrongly, that uh, the doctrine of karma in Hindu philosophy leads to fatalism, and they used to criticize uh, Hinduism quite a lot in uh, class, and uh, Radhakrishnan had to argue. that karma is not a fatalism but only implies condoning in the context in which uh, the human beings exercise their freedom so there is all there was a, always an encounter between the teachers of uh, madras christian college and dr radhakrishnan of course then he was uh, radhakrishnan and they used to criticize hindu philosophy and hindu philosophical doctrine saying that moksha is otherworldly and it has nothing to indian philosophy has nothing to contribute uh, and all that one so that uh, uh, made radhakrishnan to write a dissertation in ma the title is uh, ethics of vedanta wherein he could successfully show that indian philosophy is not pessimistic and the vedanta philosophy is uh, something which can give a new orientation to many of the problems that we are facing today and uh, so this is uh, his first encounter with uh, christianity or christian religion wherein he has to show the significance of uh, hindu philosophy and uh, after his studies he joined as uh, a, a teacher in a presidency college as a malayalam teacher that was a vacancy wherein he was placed that is malayalam teacher where of course he was teaching in the department of uh, mental and moral sciences and uh, he was uh, very much uh, uh, attracted by the vedas upanishads and uh, other indian scriptures and his strict discipline and his uh, characteristic style made him the great teacher in fact uh, a long white coat a long white coat a white turban and a pair of glasses were the marks of this great man and this has not changed at all throughout his life then in 1910 he had to uh, do this uh, lt course that is licentiate in teaching that is what we call bed now Uh, which is necessary for the associate assistant professor so after this uh, he got a permanent post and during this time this is very very fascinating during this time itself his articles got published in the international journals like the monist the quest the mind and the international journal of ethics so while he joined as a faculty member by the, uh, then itself uh, he could publish uh, or he could write in international uh, journals and uh, later he became a professor in a government arts college in uh, rajamundri in the andhra pradesh pradesh and when he was in service he published his first book his first book is uh, philosophy of uh, rabindranath tagore uh, in the year 1918 and subsequently he became a professor in uh, mysore university and uh, in 1919 uh, he met uh, mahatma gandhi and became a follower of uh, mahatma gandhi and uh, the very important book uh, of uh, radhakrishnan emerged uh, in 1920 the title of the book is the reign of religion in the contemporary philosophy and during this time he joined as a king george v professor of philosophy in calcutta university it is here he completed his magnum opus uh, indian philosophy volume 1 in 1923 and later the second volume in 1927 he could successfully show the westerners that indian philosophy is not pessimistic pessimistic and dogmatic i'll come to this uh, later because this is a very important contribution we have to say something about that but now i am giving his philosophical uh, progress or development so 1927 he wrote uh, 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 1923 he wrote the first volume of indian philosophy and 1927 the second volume of the 
so in this uh, philosophy you could uh, in this uh, two volumes you could uh, argue that each system of philosophy is an answer to a positive question which its age has put to itself so in the at the age of uh, 38 he became uh, a world famous philosopher and in the year 1926 uh, he delivered the upturn uh, lectures at uh, oxford which was later published under the title the hindu view of life and also he has uh, addressed uh, in international philosophical congress at uh, harvard and his uh, famous uh, hibbert lectures uh, were delivered in uh, 1929 and later this was published in 1932 under the title then idealist view of life the very important book this and the hindu view of life which earned him world fame so he was holding the chair of spalding professor of eastern religion and ethics in oxford in the year 1936 for 16 years and he was appointed as a vice chancellor in the banaras university banaras indian university bhu in 1939 prior to which uh, he was the vice chancellor of uh, andhra university twice that is from 1931 to 1936 and uh, this is very interesting to note uh, that a great uh, editor uh, who is known uh, as uh, uh, the editor of uh, library of living philosophers series that is arthur shilp uh, has edited a volume on radhakrishna because arthur shilp uh, the well known editor used to edit uh, the volumes on uh, great uh, thinkers like uh, Bertrand Russell, John Dewey and others, Jane Whitehead and others. But he wanted for the first time, he has chosen an Indian that is Dr. Radhakrishnan and uh, he wanted Radhakrishnan's permission to edit a volume on the philosophy of uh, Radhakrishnan. So when he met uh, Radhakrishnan and uh, he asked him uh, whether he would give permission to edit a volume on him so radhakrishnan replied oh no i am not in the company of betten russell john dewey jane whitehead and, and others on whom you have created a volume and dr shilp convinced him saying that he was too humble and it is very interesting to note that when radhakrishnan sat down to write his agreement to the volume the only blank piece of paper that they could find was a back of uh, the laundry list so radhakrishnan is the best speaker of our generation in fact uh, uh, he attained uh, uh, fame when he was very young and in 1946 he was invited by the, the us to lecture in 14 universities and all of us know that he was the chairman of uh, university education commission 1948 and the commission submitted its report on higher education or what we call now the new education policy and uh, later he was uh, made as the unesco representative in paris now after his return from paris uh, jawaharlal nehru appointed him as uh, the ambassador to usr where uh, he could meet uh, uh, stalin and there was a beautiful dialogue between them anyway i am not uh, putting that and uh, he was uh, elected vice president of india and later served for a decade from 1952 to 1962 and in this year 1962 he was uh, elected as the highest position of the country that is the president of uh, uh, india and uh, in 1975 april uh, 17th he passed away in chennai and uh, this a brief account of his life sketch as well as philosophical journey shows that he was a philosopher and all the time concentrating on philosophy and philosophical issues and he was also a person who was very much interested in uh, the indian cultural values and he is a one who spoke about uh, women's liberation long back and he said that uh, women should be liberated and if a woman in a family is uh, given education then the entire family is educated 
so he was uh, not only uh, a philosopher but a uh, uh, philosopher in the proper term he was also a social philosopher and his uh, concern was uh, to connect uh, the individual and society this is something which is uh, remarkable in him and uh, now i would like to contextualize radha krishna this is very important because uh, we have been talking about radha krishna we are uh, talking about his uh, contribution to philosophy especially indian philosophy volume 1 and 2 the the the, the most significant uh, writings of radha krishna but how do we contextualize radha krishna now how do we understand for that we have to understand uh, the notion of philosophy philosophy consists of reflection of a man's experience in relation to himself but uh, when we are talking about reflection of one's uh, experience we have to see whether one is uh, following the western ideology or indian ideology in other words what type of philosophy one is uh, subscribing to or one is following this is very important for the main reason that most of the time this issue is very important because uh, uh, we are we are we are we are uh, often right clouded by the western idea of philosophy we are quite often carried away by the western concept of philosophy so that's why we are now talking about uh, decolonizing indian philosophy and uh, uh, if you read uh, uh, one important article by by uh, kc bhattacharya that is swaraj in ideas long back that is in 1954 he talks about uh, uh, the dangers of a cultural subjection and argues that one cannot uh, uh, give up a uh, one's own tradition i am quoting this because radha krishnan who was very close to kc bhattacharya also argues that uh, there is a need for us to stay in our own tradition of course he says uh, there is nothing wrong in learning the tradition of the west or the western philosophical discourse etc etc but we should not be carried away by the western understanding of philosophy because we have our own understanding of uh, philosophy he says that there is nothing wrong in observing other uh, culture or the culture of other people only we must enhance raise and purify the elements we take over fuse them and uh, with the best in our own so our, our philosophical tradition according to him should be based on our own present uh, philosophical approach that is we cannot give up uh, our own identity this is uh, what is uh, uh, stressed by uh, our uh, great thinker radha krishnan now and then and uh, perhaps uh, keeping this in mind uh, he wrote uh, the two volumes of indian philosophy now i said that there is something which is unique in these two volumes in fact now uh, we are revisiting uh, in the revisiting uh, dr radha krishnan in many of the conference uh, we talk about uh, radha krishnan's uh, method of doing philosophy in indian philosophy and now uh, many many of us uh, including myself of course criticize radha krishnan for using the western spectacles to understand indian philosophy but now uh, i would say that that was that methodology was needed at that time because if you read uh, the volume 1 and 2 of uh, indian philosophy at each and every page uh, he would quote uh, either plato or hegel or bradley saying that uh, uh, this views uh, come very close to indian philosophical system or we to uh, in indian indian tradition shankara or ramanuja have discussed uh, is similar to this now the problem is uh there is nothing wrong in using the western methodology but uh, at the same time uh we have to stand on our own legs which means uh, we cannot wear the western spectacles to understand indian philosophical discourse this is one of the major criticism that has been leveled against uh, radha krishnan 
but uh, we should see the situation in which uh, these uh, two texts were uh, written because uh, these uh, two volumes of indian philosophy was the need of the hour because the westerners thought that in india there is no philosophy and what all we have discussed they say it is theology or religion so radha krishnan had to defend uh, indian philosophy or indian uh, uh, philosophers that is our ancient thinkers so he had to say that uh, we to have indian philosophy or some of the concepts that are uh, that are discussed in western is very much available in indian tradition so in in a defensive way radha krishnan has to uh, give certain arguments in order to show that uh, indian philosophy is something uh, uh, important and we cannot one cannot the westerners cannot uh, uh, neglect uh, the indian philosophical discourse but uh, that that was the need of our this i want to repeat once again this was this was the need of our but now we stand on our own legs in the sense that we have our own way of doing philosophy we need not to use uh, the western methodology or western tools uh, in order to understand indian philosophical discourse which means uh, uh, the contemporary indian philosophy because there is a there is a very uh, there is a, a significant question which i shall be discussing whether in contemporary indian philosophy whether uh, our contemporary indian philosophers whether they have contributed something substantially is one of the primary objection that has been made by uh, some of the critics i'll come to that later because we can club uh, we can connect radha krishnan uh, in that context so the contemporary indian philosophers uh, uh, from you know, the contemporary indian philosophers all of us know has started from uh, uh, the brahma samaj ary theosophical society brahma samaj ary samaj samaj radha krishnan uh, i mean uh, uh, dr uh, i mean uh, swami vivekananda so uh, uh, sri arabindo gandhi uh, ikbal and uh, sri um, uh, ramana maharishi and this tradition books now it is said uh, uh, that and and also i would also also make another classification because normally we make a distinction between uh, uh, indian philosophy in this way that is the classical and the contemporary uh, in my writings in many of my writings i said uh, that there is a need for us to go beyond that that is i made another classification that is a recent indian philosophy what do i mean by recent indian philosophy that uh, philosophers who are with us uh, or who have contributed substantially in the recent past for example uh, uh, for example thinkers like uh, uh, t r b murthy right thinkers like uh, a c chatterjee uh, professor sundar rajan barlinge daya krishna and many others many others uh, who have contributed substantially i would uh, place them under what we call a uh, recent indian philosophy for convenience sake now the question that is uh, quite often raised uh, in the context of contemporary indian philosophy is the contemporary indian philosophy has not made uh, any significant contribution this is one of the criticism and uh, long back uh, uh, it is said uh, that uh, after independence indian philosophers have not made any substantial contribution and uh, one such criticism comes from one swami ahenanda bharati long back some 50 years ago he says i would like to quote him no indian philosopher in this century has suggested anything new we find nothing but the old stuff dressed in impressive up to date uh, language this uh, quotation is from swami akenanda bharati some 50 to 60 years ago and he charges uh, 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 dr radha krishnan heavily now radha krishnan answers to this is something very fascinating whatever he says whatever department of thought we may cultivate in that we have to think the insights of the past right carry the inquiry further to make our own uh, contribution it is a waste of time to try to be original by despising the past and quote so he says uh, by for example he quotes uh, a in whited for example uh, radha kesh says a in whited uh, claim long back that everything in western philosophy is nothing but a 
the footnote on Plato. So by quoting Gay and Whitehead, Radhakrishnan argued that Indian philosophy, contemporary Indian philosophy, is nothing but a, a interpretation and a reinterpretation of a, the classical Indian philosophy. So this uh, answer would uh, suffice uh, to show that contemporary Indian philosophers have dealt with uh, some uh, living issues, some modern issues which are very relevant and which are uh, making, uh, which are giving a new direction to philosophy. And also, if you take the thinkers like uh, think, uh, thinkers like uh, Professor uh, uh, Sangamlal Pandey, then Professor uh, Professor uh, 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 Subhijibin Bhattacharya ji, then Professor R. Balasubramaniam. These are some of the recent uh, uh, philosophers of India or recent Indian philosophers who could successfully show a new methodology for philosophizing. Of course, what they did uh, was to show the methodology which is available in Indian tradition is also present in Western. Here, uh, the methodology which uh, was adopted by Subhijibin Bhattacharya is very fascinating. By using uh, the mathematical logic uh, of uh, the Western tradition, he could uh, examine uh, uh, the Navyanaya philosophy. So some of the methods which are available uh, could be used, no doubt. But at the same time, we cannot uh, uh, forget our own tradition. So the contemporary Indian philosophers, as well as uh, the recent Indian philosophers have contributed substantially. And what is very much available, because we are often fascinated by the Western model or Western tradition. I'll give one example. Uh, when in 1963, all of us know, Gettier, the famous Gettier, uh, wrote a one and a half page article, is uh, justified true belief knowledge. Thereby, he questioned uh, the three conditions which are uh, given for knowledge. And uh, this uh, article has uh, produced a uh, uh, lot of uh, um, um, counter uh, uh, reaction, or it made uh, philosophers to rethink uh, the conditions which are necessary for knowledge. And uh, in Western uh, epistemology, I would say, or in contemporary epistemology, this has become a project. That is, all Western epistemologies are discussing this issue. But uh, if you look at Indian philosophical tradition in Gangisa, for example, ha Gangisa has dealt uh, with uh, this issue in detail. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, our own Indian philosophical tradition uh, is very rich and it is a high time for us uh, to go back to Indian philosophical tradition so that we can understand uh, the significance of Indian philosophy. Now, uh, this is one criticism against uh, contemporary Indian philosophy. And we have seen how Radhakrishnan reacted to the criticism that has been leveled against him by Swami Akhenanda Bharati. Then there is also uh, another important thinker, uh, Professor K. Chachinananda Murthy. Now, K. Professor Chachinananda Murthy is a very well known uh, philosopher uh, from South. Uh, he was a vice chancellor of Andhra University and the vice chairman of. Uh, uh, UGC and all. Uh, he, uh, while uh, while writing about Radhakrishnan, he says uh, that Radhakrishnan was an idealist and says certainly he was not original like uh, Gaudapada or Hegel. He wrote a history of ideas, but not in the deep and uh, thorough way in which uh, Kapilstan wrote. This is, uh, I would say, this is uh, one criticism leveled against by Radha Krishnan, which has emerged from Professor Murthy. But uh, at the same time, Murthy says uh, that Radha Krishnan has done a, a great contribution by making a comparative philosophy the, uh, as the best method of doing philosophy. And he says, further, Murthy says, that Radha Krishnan's method of approach is uh, something novel and his script, scriptural interpretations are relevant and always fascinating. So he interpreted, in fact, uh, concepts like human dignity, democracy, secularism in his own way 
and try to what is important is radha krishnan try to root all these concepts uh, in indian heritage for this uh, one has to appreciate uh, the contribution made by radha krishnan now radha krishnan no doubt another criticism that is leveled against radha krishnan is that he has not uh, contributed to any independent system of philosophy it is true he could uh, he could not establish a system like nyaya vaisheshika or sankhya yoga so sometimes it is said that uh, his uh, uh, all his writings right uh, on philosophy indian philosophy is simply interpretation and some of the critics say the interpretations cannot be considered as something unique because you are trying to interpret what is uh, already available now uh, the supporters of radha krishnan argue like like uh, a student uh, um, uh, pt raju pt raju for example is a student of radha krishnan he argues that by interpreting something you are trying to say something new so the interpretational understanding is also something new in philosophical discourse of course radha krishnan uh, wrote extensively on uh, Uh, the ontological commitment namely the three ontological uh, commitment or the metaphysical realities like uh, god man and world and their synthesis and all that one and also as i said beginning he wrote extensively on the relation that exists between individual and society and so his social philosophy is uh, something very remarkable but uh, i am i am more concerned about uh, the philosophical position of radha krishnan where do you place uh, radha krishnan in indian tradition now already i said eh, that uh, radha krishnan uh, though belongs to the contemporary field of philosophy or he belongs to the tradition of contemporary indian philosopher the contemporary indian philosophy has also contributed something substantially for uh, the progress of philosophy here i would like to show uh, the slight difference between uh, Uh, this is how I approach. Uh, my approach may be wrong. The, the difference between uh, contemporary classical Indian philosophy and uh, contemporary Indian. Philosophy. What is the difference? Of course, this is my my observation. I may be wrong because uh, great thinkers like uh, my guru, like uh, Jada Shankar Ji, is available. You may correct me if I am wrong. Now I feel that in the classical Indian philosophy, right? In the classical Indian philosophy. we are more concerned about uh, uh, concerned about uh, the self or jiva whereas in in contemporary indian philosophy we are concerned about man as such man as such human being so here we talk about both body and mind that is the reason why the contemporary indian philosophy says the need for uh, the liberation uh, uh, of human being uh, one example is uh, um, uh, dr uh, sorry one example is sri arbindo who talked about uh, the cosmic salvation and if you go to uh, swami vivekananda uh, i would like to quote his very important quotation uh, he says i i i uh, i do not believe in a religion which cannot wipe out the tears of a widow or which cannot bring a loaf of bread to an orphan's mouth this means uh, uh, swami vivekananda was more concerned about the society and the human beings the downtrodden that's why he calls the poor as a daridra narayana so there is a concern for the human beings as such so this uh, i would say is a major distinction between uh between between uh, the classical and the contemporary indian philosophy if necessary i'll elaborate this uh, later and uh, so the contemporary indian philosophy's contribution cannot be cannot be cannot be neglected we can't simply say oh they have simply uh, 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 interpreted they have not made uh, uh, any significant contribution now uh, with this uh, uh, background let me very briefly analyze uh, philosophical position of uh, radha krishnan where do we place uh, radha krishnan in the uh, indian tradition now there are four uh, philosophical position which we have to take into account the first one is some argue 
that he was a true follower of shankara and many uh, many many uh, would substantiate this view that he was a true follower of shankara it is said that he was a traditional advaitin that is advaitin to the core and uh, he was reconstructing only the advaita of shankara for example uh, professor t m p mahadevan our great teacher uh, felt uh, that uh, he was uh, expounding right he was expounding the philosophy of uh, uh, advaita vedanta that is uh, shankara's uh, philosophy of advaita vedanta and uh, showing that uh, the idealistic uh, uh, tradition is very much important uh, in indian context so radhakrishnan according to uh, according to uh, uh, according to um, kempi mahadevan uh, radhakrishnan spoke about the absolute idealism of uh, uh, shankara this is one perspective and also another uh, thinker pt raju also argues that uh, uh, radhakrishnan was uh, supporting the later advaitin that is he was uh, more concerned about uh, he could be placed under uh, post shankara advaita veda rather than placing him in the uh, uh, tradition of shankara the post shankara uh, would be apt according to pt raju this is the second position now the third position is something very important where in some of the uh, foreign scholars like uh, es brightman marlo and others they argue that uh, radhakrishnan should be placed uh, in a uh, ramanujais tradition that is he is a full and full vishishta advaitin in the sense uh, that uh, he followed that is uh, radhakrishnan followed uh, ramanuja and not shankara and there are some indian scholars like ar wadia and uh, many others talk about uh, ss raghavachar from south both of them argue that he should be placed in uh, which is started by the tradition this is the third approach which is uh, very much available in radhakrishna writings uh, then the fourth approach is something very interesting they say neither uh, radhakrishna is neither an advaitin nor a vishishta advaitin but uphold uh, the position which is uh, common to both in fact they say that he has combined uh, both uh, advaita and vishishta advaita there are uh, three thinkers whom i would like to mention here one is uh, rc zainer and uh, later uh, the canadian philosopher j g arapura of course he is from uh, sir kindly unmute yourself please i don't know when this happened sorry uh, so uh, this is a fourth position where we see the synthesis uh, between uh, shankara and ramanuja or uh, he could be uh, the uh, he could be considered as a synthesizer between uh, uh, advaita and vishishta advaita now where i would like to locate radhakrishna radhakrishna can never be placed in advaitic tradition why because if you read uh, uh, indian philosophy volume 1 uh especially in page 674 there is a beautiful discussion and he says that he is uh, different from shankara there is one 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 uh, phrase which is fascinating while uh, commenting on advaita vedanta he says unreal the world illusory it is not unreal the world illusory it is not this is a famous quotation of uh, dr radhakrishnan wherein he tried to argue that there is a distinction between the illusoriness of the world and unreality of the world and he argues that both are different now the advaitins will have a difficulty in fact i should say that uh, long back when we had the centenary celebration of dr radhakrishnan the uh, madras university brought out uh, a volume a special volume on dr radhakrishnan and many advaitins the traditional advaitins severely criticized radhakrishnan for interpreting uh, advaita in this way they say this uh, uh, understanding is not at all acceptable and this is not available in advaita vedanta so the traditional advaitins uh, were vehement in criticizing uh, this approach of radhakrishnan 
But Radha Krishnan writes, I quote him, while the general spirit of uh, Shankara's philosophy is commented, uh, commented in many uh, in in my writings, sorry, in my writings, on many essential points, I have developed an independent line. This passage, uh, which is available in page uh, six seven four of uh, Indian Philosophy Volume One, clearly shows he is of the view that though he follows Shankara in spirit. Uh, he has deviated from Shankara in many aspects, thus giving an independent orientation to Advaitic framework. Now, the question, the last question, uh, which I would like to address uh, here is, was he an independent thinker or interpreter? Now, the great contribution of uh, the saints and sages of India, starting from Vyas, we have enriched our Indian philosophical tradition by showing the value of uh, our philosophical discourse, which means in the classical context or in classical Indian philosophy, no doubt, that is something very original and very independent, and it is based on the pure tradition. And this has made a tremendous uh, uh, influence on our uh, on our uh, classical tradition. A beautiful dialogue, for example, if you if you, if you read uh, the beautiful dialogue uh, between uh, between between the Mimamsakas and the Advaitins with regard to the sentence meaning Anmita Bitana Vada and Abhitan Vada, you can see how our ancient thinkers could develop. Uh, their uh, independent thinking without being influenced by the outside culture or outside agents. So the tradition, our tradition, or the classical Indian tradition is something remarkable, something original and rich. But uh, does it mean that uh, there is no place for interpretation? Should we say that only the classical Indian philosophy is acceptable? Or it is uh, more, more, uh, more argumentative, or more valuable and uh, uh, acceptable. Now, this question uh, is very important because there are many, uh, uh, many, many thinkers, many uh, teachers uh, in philosophy. They have written. Uh, I come across recently uh, a book uh, wherein it is argued that uh, Indian philosophy, I mean, again, contemporary, there is no proper argument and all, which uh, I cannot accept. Anyhow, the interpretation itself uh, uh, is argumentative in, in nature. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a connection between tradition and modernity. There is an inseparable connection between the classical Indian philosophy and uh, the contemporary Indian philosophy. So, in fact, I would say the world, the world, world, uh, the old and the new are interconnected. In fact, uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan, while writing on this uh, important question, says uh, that Shankara's, while writing on Shankara, he says, Shankara's modesty makes him to say that uh, the doctrine he is expounding is nothing more than what is contained in the Vedas. This is available in Indian Philosophy Volume 2. I repeat. Shankara's modesty, this is what uh, Radhakshi writes, Shankara's modesty makes him to say that the doctrine he is expounding is nothing more than what is contained in the Vedas. He says that it is not, uh, it is difficult to decide whether Shankara is uh, a continuation of the past or a reinterpretation or reinvention or an addition to the world. This is what Radhakrishna says. Further, Radhakrishna says, we cannot distinguish the world from the new, for in the living, the world is new and the new is old. So here, this last sentence, namely the world in the new and the new in the world, is something which has to be taken very seriously. This statement of Radhakrishna has a lot of implication because he, in this statement, tries to show that we cannot uh, make uh, a very clear-cut demarcation. There is a demarcation between 
tradition and modernity. In fact, uh, in Kyoto School in Japan, uh, they talk about how the world and the new can go together. The world, the old, they say, is available in the new, and the the new can comfortably travel with the old. So, in the Indian tradition, it is Radha Krishna who said that the tradition and modernity can go together. The only thing is, the tradition, if something is not relevant. Uh, it has to be reinterpreted or we have to see how far it is acceptable to the present historical situation. So I would like to conclude by saying that in the methodology of uh, Radhakrishnan, there is something new. Though he was, uh, 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 he was not an original thinker, original thinker in the sense, uh, I mean, that his interpretation has been playing a very important role. So we can call him as the interpreter. But the interpretation is very much needed because Indian philosophy is uh, so rich that different interpretations or different modalities are possible or allowed in Indian philosophical tradition. So Radhakrishnan has given a new methodology for understanding and a way, a new way of uh, looking at uh, Indian philosophical tradition. So this method, uh, which uh, was uh, elaborately discussed by, uh, by, by, by Radhakrishnan. In all his writings, clearly show that uh, the contemporary Indian philosophers have contributed something new in the tradition of Indian philosophy. So with this, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers, especially my good friend, Professor Anand Mishraji, and uh, uh, the colleagues of the department, and also Shruti, for giving me this uh, nice opportunity of uh, discussing my, uh, uh, sharing my views with uh, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you very much. Very enlightening lecture. Vidyamcha avidyamcha yastad vedo bhayam saha. Avidyamrityam tirtva vidyamrityam ashmrati. He who knows that has more than one the knowledge and the ignorance. By the ignorance crosses beyond death and with the knowledge enjoys immortality. Vidya is that which liberates, and this Vidya is possible only through a teacher. So I think, sir, Radhakrishnan feels that the main function of a philosophical inquiry is to find an explanation of the universe. The explaining principle has to be ultimately real because it has to be provide a basis of everything real. Therefore, Radha Krishna thinks that the ultimate reality must be able to satisfy all questions regarding the how and why of the universe. Yeah. So, thank you very much. Now, the students as well as scholars who are present here uh, on this virtual platform may have some queries, may have some questions definitely. regarding your lecture. Kindly definitely. allow them to ask whatever yeah, they yeah, are. Definitely, having. definitely, yeah. definitely. So, pressure, yeah. please. Um, Sir, one student, uh, first of all, uh, Gopal Sahu, sir, has asked a question three minutes ago. Can we have an example of Radha Krishnan's comparative method uh, in, of doing philosophy that has solved an outstanding philosophical problem that had been asked by Gopal Sahu, sir, just three minutes ago, sir? Okay. Now, this comparative method of doing philosophy, uh, I, I have my own uh, difficulty with regard to the comparative method which is uh, adopted now. In fact, once I was very much fascinated by this comparative uh, method or methodology. Uh, but uh, now I am a little skeptic about uh, the comparative methodology or comparative philosophy, uh, because uh, there should be some uh, uh, similarities as well as differences with regard to comparison. But sometimes uh, we are making a very vague comparison, this is what I feel. But uh, Radha Krishnan, uh, Radha Krishnan's, uh, during, uh, I mean, during the time of Radha Krishnan, the comparative philosophy is something, in fact, uh, one of his major contribution is uh, with regard to the field of uh, comparative philosophy. But the comparative philosophy, for example, he was using uh, the Western uh, methodology to understand uh, Indian and uh, vice versa. So this method has certain limitation, I think. And moreover, I feel why do we make uh, use of this uh, comparative method? Why this is not? Because perhaps at that time, as I said in my lecture, at that time, 
it was a need of Nawaz. We have to show certain uh, parallels in order to show that Indian philosophy is not uh, dogmatic. It has something to contribute. That's okay. But now I don't think uh, that this method uh, will not uh, will not uh, help us, uh, or we can do our uh, own way of doing philosophy. This is my way of understanding the comparative method. But uh, uh, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. I don't. Know. Sure, sir. Uh, uh, of course, Rajan just moved, but before you, uh, another a student had already asked a question. I would like to mention here first. Uh, just a minute. Sir, uh, student uh, Rajneesh Mishra. Uh, can, can, uh, excuse me. Can I can I uh, ask a question, Dr. Shruti Mishra? Sure, can sir. I? Sir, please, sir, please. Sir, uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Uh, my query is to explore whether all kind of comparative methods of doing philosophy is basically reducible to the analogical argument uh, that we are all familiar with. And an analogical argument will be either strong or weak based on the strongness of the points to be compared or not. So what I'm just suggesting, not exactly in relation to uh, Radha Krishna comparative philosophy in general, can there be a methods of comparison of doing philosophy over and above an analogical argument? Hmm. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Sagu, for a very interesting question. Now, uh, I feel, uh, first of all, this uh, comparative method which uh, we have been adopting uh has certain problems for example uh there is a, a sort of a reductionism uh, that is involved one cannot escape from this reductionism you want to ultimately prove that one is better than the other or one uh, is uh, is to be rejected something like that this is this is where i feel the comparative methodology takes us so the, the there is a no in fact, uh, in, in a comparison, uh, comparative method, you have to show both uh, the similarities and differences. But instead, I would say that only parallels could be attempted. Um, you can say that in parallels and leave it. Uh, apart from that, you don't have to claim that uh, this is a similarity and this is a difference. And it's very difficult also. Because why? Because uh, there is always a cultural relativism that is involved. Long back when I wrote my thesis, I was very much fascinated by, by, by this, uh, by this uh, uh, comparative methodology. So I uh, used uh, Wittgensen and Shankara, uh, but that is not a comparative method. Never I said it is a comparative method. In fact, I said I am making an attempt to show a certain parallel. That is, uh, though the uh, traditions are different, cultures are different, there could be a possibility where uh, two different traditions can think alike. That's all. I, we have to stop that. But apart from that, you want uh, to develop a method of comparison. Uh, I, I have my own doubt whether now the comparative philosophy or the comparative method is uh, a fascinating one. Now, I have my own doubt because just... no, it, it, it's very difficult. But, uh, but I don't know this is how I would like to answer. Because I have taken a different position now with regard to comparative position, but I don't know whether I am right or wrong. But this is my position. Th I may be wrong much. also. Th thank you very much, sir. Thank, thank you. you thank you, Professor Sahu. Shall I ask something? Sir, please, sir. Uh, uh, I must thank uh, Professor uh, Pani Silvam for his nice speech. Now, I remember uh, during our younger days, we used to read two books. Uh, the first one is uh, Radha Krishnan's Eastern Religion and Western Thought. And the other one was two volumes of books by uh, uh, edited by uh, Professor Humayun Kabir and Professor Radhakrishnan, um, uh, uh, two volumes of 
philosophy the first one belonging to the uh, eastern philosophies and the second one uh, the western philosophies now uh, in the preface of those two books uh, i have as far as i remember i don't remember it uh, uh, because it was uh, 50 years back we used to read and uh, uh, i am fortunate to be uh, the students of uh, student of um, professor satyavadi misra who was direct uh, who was direct student of uh, professor radhakrishnan in um, bhu and professor s k chattopadhyay who was direct student of radhakrishnan in calcutta university so they they were our, they were my teachers and they advised me to read go through these two books these three books but there I, what i find as professor panir silvam says this interpretational understanding the methodology of interpretational understanding along with this the the thinker also tries to put forth uh, his own view point so we just um, um, uh, cannot just discard it by saying that only he has made a comparative understanding of things he has put his own views on this uh, uh, on his uh, uh, views on philosophy from uh, this much what i have gathered from this two books and professor silvam um, uh, <laughs> will reply on this thank you yes, thank sir. you thank you thank you uh, thank you professor uh, ranjit ji for a very nice posting yeah these two books are very important especially the first one which you have mentioned uh, eastern religion and western thought where he is making a comparative methodology but uh, the problem is uh, this comparative methodology will not uh, will help us no doubt will help us to understand the other tradition other religion but uh, what purpose uh, it would serve uh in the sense of course we can understand uh, the other religion but, uh, but the problem is uh, there is always a limitation uh no one example i would like to give in this context is uh, the inter religious dialogue uh, that is taking place uh, everywhere now uh, now what is what is the main idea what is that we want to uh, arrive at there is some problem with regard to this methodology the comparative methodology because the comparative methodology of course it is not mere uh, interpretation i agree that and uh, radha krishna especially radha krishna radha krishna besides this interpretation he is trying to say something new that is why we are uh, st uh, still remembering radha krishna and his contribution but uh, this methodology i feel as its own limitation uh, and at that time and uh, we have to as i said we have to contextualize radha krishna we have to go back to the situation in which these books were written eastern religion and western thought and uh, reign of religion on the all other books eh? uh religious books as well as philosophical books and uh, including uh, an idealist view of life or hindu view of life, all this how to be situated in that context but now many of these ideas uh, uh uh are acceptable no doubt but at the same time this comparative methodology i feel has its own limitation and i don't think uh, that comparing indian with the western is uh, no more uh, needed of course uh, we can understand the west no doubt but it has one limitation and another important thing i always feel uh see as professor uh, jain mohanty very clearly said that uh, all the time we have been uh, reading western tradition no doubt we are trying to read them we are trying to interpret them uh, we try to see indian philosophy through western glass or western ideas that's everything is fine but he further he said this high time for the western is also to read indian philosophical discourse this is not happening so this methodology i feel is very important that we have our own uh, philosophical discourse we can understand it uh, fully without uh, the help of uh, 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 the others i mean the western uh, uh, i mean methodology uh, may i ask a question of uh, dear uh, alok ji good morning yeah, yeah. thank you so thank please. you very much dr paneer uh, for your i must say marathon uh, discourses <laughs> yesterday i was hearing you from bengal today we, i am hearing you from uh, bhu uh, i don't know uh, must uh, pay lot of 
joy and lot of uh, support to your 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 uh, philosophical endeavor in placing indian philosophy uh, into into a context but my question is a very old one uh, when you place dr radha krishnan not as an original thinker in a very modest way uh, i agree but when you say that his interpretations may be novel or an interpretation may be may contain always something new uh, i may relate it to your yesterday's talk on hermeneutics of gadamer so can you relate that interpretative method to radha krishnan's interpretation and the the next question related to this one is that uh, if we take uh, interpretation uh, very seriously then can you say that radha krishnan's interpretation of buddhism is a new interpretation or a misinterpretation as was very much criticized by uh, uh, a very well known hindi uh, writer uh, rahul sankar tan in his book darshan dik darshan thank yeah. you thank you thank you alok ji for a very interesting questions first i would like to take the second question Uh, now uh, i mean i would like to say that radha krishnan's interpretation uh, i would like to say humbly that radha krishnan's interpretation of buddhism is totally wrong for the main reason that he is trying to do an uh, 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 an interpretation which is uh, not at all acceptable to the buddhist in fact uh, there is uh, some indian philosophers uh, i mean contemporary indian philosophers try to see uh, buddhism as a part of a uh, indian philosophy i mean as part of uh, advaitic tradition uh, in fact i i don't remember the quotation of uh, radha krishnan wherein he tries to argue that it comes very close to advaita this is something very very disturbing to me and uh, i always feel that he has misinterpreted uh, uh, buddhism this is my first uh, uh, answer Fine. Second one, interpretation. Yeah, Radha Krishnan is a, 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 a great personality who has interpreted our classical uh, uh, systems of philosophy. But uh, uh, if you want me to relate it to the Gadamerian understanding, I would say there are many commonalities. One is uh, with regard to the uh, the tradition. As I said yesterday, now tradition is that which connects the past, present, and future. and radha krishnan as a great uh, a supporter of uh, tradition he always uh, believed that it is uh, the past which uh, shapes the present and both these would uh, uh, help us to know the future so radha krishnan also supports uh, the tradition and the heritage uh, which uh, gadamer uh, uh, would also support and also another thing is the interpretation and understanding uh, kindly remember yesterday i said the third aspect of uh, uh, gadamer is uh, interpretation and understanding wherein i said that interpretation is understanding and under, under uh, sorry inter- understanding is inter- both are taking place simultaneously now if we apply that criterion to radha krishnan we can boldly say that it is radha krishnan who could combine both interpretation and understanding and understanding in both uh, take place simultaneously so i would say that gadamer comes close to radha krishna or radha krishna uh, ka, i mean comes very close to uh, gadamer so because uh, both of them first of all accept uh, the tradition as something uh, which is very important for us radha krishna cannot uh, step up of uh, step out of our tradition thank you that is thank you sir can i ask sir could i speak a few words yes sir yes sir sir yeah, Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, I, I I sincerely appreciate uh, the excellent lecture delivered by Professor Panir Savanji, my good friend. Here I have no question, but only I would like to add a few points. Sir, uh, Dr. Radha Krishna, it is true that he makes a distinction between uh, sense, intellect, and intuition, and he is he said that intellect. Uh, it disintegrates but it is the intuition that uh, synthesizes so he said that uh, the distinction between man and other creatures in the in this universe 
is that man is endowed with intuition so therefore one must reach to the higher stage of uh, intuition uh, and uh, surpassing this intellect uh, intellect and in this context rana krishnan said the art religion and uh, morality that we speak in terms of in human life uh, they are nothing but the result of uh, intuition he says here the distinction between sense intellect and intuition we find such a distinction also in the philosophy of uh, bergson bergson so radha krishnan he said that he made a reconciliation between west and the east and in this context radha krishnan has taken probably i feel that he has taken while speaking about the distinction between sense intellect and intuition radha krishnan might have taken the source from bergson's philosophy that is one thing the next thing is i want like to say that radha krishnan is a supporter of the doctrine of karma this is already pointed out by professor pani salam during his lecture in this context i would like to say radha krishnan says that my present life is due to my the karma that is what i did in my past life but my future life lies in me in this present life i got freedom and uh, i am free to do my actions in this present life so his doctrine of karma that radha krishnan supports he is not antagonistic to the doctrine of freedom and this is already pointed out by professor pani selvam in his lecture in this context uh, radha krishnan uh, he has uh, given a beautiful example radha krishnan says that my life is like a life human life is like a playing of cards the while playing the cards i am the water what are the cards that i got it the cards that i receive they are already determined but how i play with these cards it depends on i got freedom i got freedom in uh, uh, in mingling the cards in playing with these cards so therefore radha krishna said that life is like we got uh, uh, now there is a there is a doctrine of karma is there is support of karma but doctrine of, but uh, radha krishna says that this doctrine of karma is not in a way antagonistic to human freedom thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank this you. is not a question thank sir you. this is only my okay. a few much, points sir. i have thank you thank you very much sir sir thanks to all of you okay. sir uh, dr rahul oh. morey has also uh, uh, he also wants to say something uh, dr rahul uh, morey could you please ask uh, your questions please yes thank you uh, thank you dr sathi uh, thank you so much sir for uh, your uh, wonderful uh, presentation i have thoroughly enjoyed Uh, uh sir i have just one uh, small question uh, and which is directed to uh, this classical indian philosophy right i have been wondering for a long time uh, that since this classical indian philosophy has always focused on liberation or moksha and the way they talk about is uh, by meditating we can uh, actually achieve the detachment of soul with this world or you can say worldly object and that is how this moksha could be attained but my point is how we have actually reached to this uh, worldly bondage how we have actually reached to this uh, uh, clingingness to this world it is not that we have wrongly practice a certain kind of meditation and that's why by practicing a right sort of meditation we can undo this attachment to the world and achieve detachment with this world so i think and if we really rely on this meditation this also becomes very individualistic or uh, it also becomes a sort of escapism from this world or you can say from uh, social liberation so i think if we really uh, focus on the kind of social institution and political system we have got in or which are already there and we got birth in and that has emboldened the attachment with this world right and perpetuated our clingingness to this world suppose if the social institutions are changed right if we um, uh, start practicing certain kinds of uh, traditions or cultures which are against the attachment right then i think we can socially achieve uh, a certain kind of liberation that is taught in indian 
uh, classical Indian philosophy. Suppose if we uh, abolish this private property, right? Then I think uh, uh, to the large extent, this uh, detachment with this world can be done away with. And similarly, I mean, if we start practicing the uh, uh, equal relations with every other human being, if we are not practicing any inequality, which is practiced at the society level, then I think uh, to the most uh, extent, we can achieve this social liberation, which has been uh, uh, talked about to be achieved by focusing on this individual meditation. So this is just my... Uh, 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 inquisitiveness to know. I don't know whether I'm right to put this sort of questions or not. I think, sir, you would uh, really enlighten us. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rahul ji. <clears throat> uh, all of us know that uh, in Indian philosophical tradition, moksha is the parama purushatta, which means it is said that it is the duty of uh, each and every individual to attain uh, liberation or moksha. But uh, what is this nature of moksha? All of us know that there is no common agreement among uh, 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 the classical Indian philosophical system. And in the contemporary period, all of us know that uh, there, uh, there has been a debate uh, whether moksha is immanent or transcendental. Right? For example, thinkers like K. J. Shah, Daya Krishna, Barlinge, Sundar Rajan, uh, and many others, Rajendra Prasad, these great thinkers have discussed this issue whether moksha can be attained in this liberation, in this world itself. So they were trying to define moksha or they are trying to reinterpret uh, the notion of uh, moksha from the common man's point of view or from the social point of view. So I feel that in Indian classical philosophy, both uh, the individualistic uh, understanding of moksha as well as uh, the social aspect of moksha is very much present. So the classical Indian philosophy gives uh, a methodology for both. So this methodology has to be properly followed or which has to be adopted by knowing how one can, uh, uh, one can, one can transcend uh, ignorance or one can come out of the bondage. Once this bondage is uh, removed, then automatically we gain uh, independence and Moksha is uh, liberation or, uh, uh, I mean, independent nature. Now, in fact, in the West, uh, though I am, I am tempted to say this, uh, uh, I'll, I'll uh, refrain from making this statement because uh, just now I said that the Western methodology is not acceptable. But uh, let me say only one sentence. In West, uh, they talk about emancipation. Yesterday, we have talked about emancipation of the text. And Habermas, for example, talks about the emancipation interest. Now, in Indian context, we talk about the emancipation of the individual. So, Indian philosophers have dealt with uh, the social aspect of moksha as well as uh, the individualistic aspect of moksha, which has to be celebrated in Indian context. This is very, very important. So, Indian classical Indian philosophy gives us certain guidelines. Only thing is we, uh, we, we fail to follow the guidelines that is given in the scripture. Thank you, Raghunji. So thank you very much. Good thing I'm, uh, if I'm allowed to ask. Me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. ask, ask your question. Please. Shall I, shall I ask uh, another question, please? Please, sir. So, uh, uh, Professor Silvam, uh, the, when we talk, uh, uh, what we used to uh, give the example uh, to our students on Radha Krishnan's version of intuition. Hmm. We just say that uh, we the, bring that great saying, Brahma with Brahma Eva Bhavati. Bhavati yeah. Now, this Eva is uh, an epistemological uh, issue as far as I think, and not a, a metaphysical uh, identity between Brahma with and Brahma. Uh, because uh, this is uh, why I am telling this. Uh, I, I, when I was working with Professor Dayakrishna, he used to tell me always, that uh, don't accept anything of the Indian uh, uh, person without questioning. You go on questioning from it, it uh, to uh, the, any proposition from multifarious uh, angles. But uh, so for <laughs> taking the clue from that, I think wh what is your reaction on this? This evil? It is uh, epistemological or metaphysical in the sense of. Uh, 
Now, uh, before answering that uh, in little bit detail, I would uh, like to go back to what Professor Samasiva Prasad uh, has also said with regard to intellect in intuition. Radha Krishnan, all of us, he has also pointed out that Radha Krishnan talks about three ways of knowing. The first one is a sense perception, as rightly pointed out by Samasiva Prasad. Then comes uh, intellect and uh, then uh, intuition. And uh, further, Radha Krishnan says these are three grades. Perception is the lowest and uh, little uh, above we have intellect and then the highest is uh, the uh, intellect. And the intellectual, uh, sorry, intuitive. The intuitive knowledge is something supreme and it is something which can include everything. So this is sometimes is identical with uh, the supreme Brahman or uh, something uh, once we know uh, as uh, um, Mundaka says, Mundaka Upanishad says, to know Brahman is to become Brahman. That uh, falls within the framework of uh, intuition. So Radha Krishnan considers uh, that uh, intuitive as uh, something supreme. And I vaguely remember uh, that uh, he uh, he says I, I'm not sure, but I'm I'm that's why I'm saying I'm very I, I, I vaguely remember. Uh, I feel he says that the Western philosophy always talks about uh, reason uh, or uh, logical understanding. Whereas Indian philosophy is intuitive. Now, at that time, I, I was in fact fascinated by these three ways of uh, uh, knowing uh, during my student days. But after reading uh, Jain Mohanty, I got a different uh, understanding because Jain Mohanty, in one place, says uh, that the, the assumption or the presumption that Indian philosophy is intuitive and uh, Western philosophy is uh, intellect. Uh, is a misnomer. He says that uh, both are intuitive as well as uh, intellect by nature. So this uh, classification, this, this is one way of uh, uh, saying that uh, Western philosophical discourse or Western methodology is intellect. Uh, does it mean that Indian philosophy uh, lacks uh, the reasoning? This is uh, no. Jain Monty says, uh, that both are present in both uh, Indian and Western philosophy. This is uh, what I would like to submit uh, in this context. Uh, uh, no, uh, no, sir, then, sir, uh, no, do you accept that uh, this intuitive knowledge of Radha Krishnan is similar to Habermas uh, classification of reflective knowledge? Uh, yeah, but at the same time, I have a difficulty. Now, what is that? One is metaphysical and other is non-metaphysical. In Indian context, we talk about uh, this intuitive knowledge uh, only from the framework of uh, the metaphysical realm. But in uh, Habermas, it is not so. It is something directly connected to the world. I mean, though he is not using the word empirical, it has something very directly connected to the empirical life. I mean, to the, to the world. Let me use the word world instead of empirical. So there is a difference. There is a difference. So before any further queries, I thank would you, like sir. to suggest that uh, you, uh, our two uh, research scholars, our uh, two very promising research scholars, they are uh, waiting since long to ask some questions. Uh, will you please allow them to ask? Yes, them? yes, sir. Please, please. Uh, please Rajan please. and Rajneesh, will you please ask your questions? Yeah, ma'am. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity. Uh, with all due respect to Dr. Radha Krishnan. Sir, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, counter your thesis when you said uh, on the basis of Whitehead Court that all the Western philosophy is a footpath to Plato and you justified the Radha Krishnan view that talking about novelty is an absurd thing. But you know, sir, this quotation is quite misinterpreted. When we say that all the Western philosophy is a footpath to Plato, then we say that Western philosophy is basically progressing by rejecting Plato, not coping Pl uh, Plato's ideas. So this is the thing. And may, would you please explain this thing in this realm rather than that? Can you say that we are also uh, uh, rejecting the ancient ideas or we are coping the, uh, our uh, ancient Indian ideas? My second question is that, you know, uh, the idea which uh, Radha Krishnan proposed in Eastern religion and Western thought is quite controversial. And, you know, uh, I feel uh, it is a crisis for us. You know, when Albert Schweitzer proposes some challenges to Indian philosophy, which basically gives us a meaning to, to, to find some new answer, uh, whether Indian philosophy is life negating or life affirming, whether Indian philosophy is a closed system or is an open system. You know, 
in uh, in the book radha krishnan uh, accepted those allegations which albert swizers basically proposes if you look at the central thesis of eastern religion and western thought we find that he has accepted that spirituality is the essence of indian philosophy he accepted that metaphysics is the essence of indian philosophy and same thing has already in the future refuted by daya krishnan in indian philosophy counter perspective when we say the three mean, uh, myths of indian philosophy so what would you say uh, if uh, daya krishnan proposes your question whether indian philosophy is all about metaphysics or or, or or all about spirituality or not and my third question is regarding religion sir uh, we can accept in one way or another that religion is one of the core idea of the core uh, philosophical point of radha, radha krishnan philosophy sir my challenge is that when religion was already died when it say and, and uh, in recent article by sabhajit mis the idea of god was already died by by the time of hegel then what was the need to revive the uh, religion in, uh, in when it was very challenging for us when science was giving us the meaning what was the need to revive the religion and then we have already seen the dark ages and then when we have already seen the uh, two world wars there was some elements of religious conflict as well there so religious conflict and the allegations of spirituality and what would you say on such kind of things sir okay <laughs> a cluster of questions by my dear uh, good friend rajan but let me try to answer uh, your questions now ann whited ann whited says that uh, everything uh, that uh, comes after plato is nothing but uh, a footnote on plato and radha krishnan quotes that that's what i was referring to now when uh, ann whited said that everything is footnote on plato he meant uh, that philosophers are mainly discussing uh, two or three issues now and then what is that the problem of one and the many the problem of uh, form f capital or uh, or or say being and uh, similar issues so all philosophers in the contem till the modern period or till uh, in, the, in the in the contemporary period also philosophers have been talking about now only in the analytic philosophy and in the phenomenological tradition this approach is changed but till then philosophers have been talking about uh, in even in phenomenology we talk about being so this is a uh, keeping this in mind of course and white had meant uh, that everything is uh, footnote on plato which means we are repeating what uh, uh, plato has said or what uh, we are giving extension to uh, the notes of uh, plato so there is nothing wrong in saying that in fact uh, i must tell you here that there is nothing wrong in one being a metaphysician that is a very nice thing also i would say but uh, as a uh, walsh says walsh says uh, that there is nothing wrong in one being a metaphysician but uh, whether you are giving proper argument in support of your metaphysical claims that is important so metaphysics is uh, uh, nothing wrong you can be a metaphysician but how do you substantiate your statements or your argument that is very important so now what we are doing is we are revisiting plato now we are revisiting some of the uh, Uh, pre-socratic thinkers like heraclitus or parmenides and try to show that how this could be uh, relevant in the present historical situation now take for in example heidegger heidegger is a philosopher who talked about only one concept throughout his life that is being so now he is trying to reinterpret the concept of being by revisiting it and trying to give the aristotelian definition or the definition that is a very tabulated in pre socratic period so that is uh, when when uh, ann white had said that everything is footnote on uh, plato we have to take it up with a pinch of salt no doubt but at the same time there is lot of a uh, implication which is uh, very much available in that that means uh, philosophers have been now i quote uh, richard rorty for example richard rorty says philosophers have been polishing the mirror of mind so that they can have the better so, so that they can have better vision of themselves what does this mean philosophers all the time talking about uh, the concept of mind 
or the concept of uh, uh, being or form in platonic understanding or the problem of one and the many philosophers cannot uh, reject that if philosophers are not going to discuss metaphysics metaphysics then what else they are going to do this is my question and secondly i would like to show that there is a, some problem in 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 accepting the age old uh, uh, concepts but uh, they are the presuppositions which uh, give strength to the philosophical discourse of course thinkers like derrida would say that there is in philosophical discourse there is no such a center because being for example is a center this is what we have been thinking now derrida comes to the scene and argues no there is no such center there is no consciousness which is a center we often think that so all this have to be uh, dismissed this is one perspective but the other perspective is we are once again going back to this uh, Uh, uh issues concepts so we are repeating so what is harm in accepting plato i mean uh, ain white its contention that uh, we are uh, uh, we are plato's uh, i mean what we are doing is nothing but put note on plato this is my first one secondly uh metaphysics i don't know i i forgot then second one is what is the need uh, second one i wrote down okay. sir two question so, on religion and uh, religion and what all is the, the spiritual and his spirituality yeah i feel that one at this juncture that is in the 21st century there is a need for a religion of course there are some religious conflicts no doubt now you can't find a fault uh, with a religion for that it is human beings so the purpose of uh, religion is to unite human beings and the religion is making all his attempt to bring all people together but if there are certain uh, religious conflict take place among people religion cannot be dispensed with and i strongly feel that religion gives a uh, uh, consolation it gives a methodology it gives uh, 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 a life it uh, it uh, gives a uh, norms for understanding human life so i feel that uh, in the 21st century religion cannot be dispensed and uh, never science can uh, replace uh, the role of religion this is my uh, humble view then one more question you is asked but i i forgot some metaphysics you said uh, sir uh, it right? is all, it was about spirituality radha krishnan accepted that indian philosophy is all about spirituality which later radha yeah. krishnan ah, refuted yeah, i got it thank you thank you now this is a very important question rajan because uh radha krishnan and many contemporary thinkers right uh, they are of the view that uh, indian philosophy is spiritual uh, but uh, this has been vehemently criticized by thinkers like uh, um, um, daya krishna rajendra prasad and many others rajendra prasad for example argues that the main problem with uh, uh, indian uh, philosophical discourse is that we have developed a what is known as a yes t conception yes capital t capital this is known as a spiritualistic and transcendental concepts we often think that indian philosophy is spiritual and it is transcendental by nature and he argues that it is not like that there are other issues which philosophers can discuss and the the, the idea in fact rather um, daya also reject that so there are other ways of doing philosophy according to them but i would like to state here that these are different modes of understanding indian philosophy uh, the three myths uh, which are pointed out is very much uh, uh, necessary for understanding or re understanding indian philosophical discourse all these are fine but uh, if you discuss once again i want to say if you dispense metaphysics then philosophers have no role to play in fact they have to criticize metaphysics that should be their job of course you take any 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 uh, philosopher there there is a uh, the ontological commitment uh, in their uh, methodology thank you sir thank you for this excellent presentation and uh, you putting the all critic of radha krishnan's philosophy yes, my please, question sir, you want to ask any question so yes, ask me as yes, sure, ma'am sure. i am yeah. and um, my question is regarding to radha krishnan's approach as uh, sir mentioned that 
he used the western spectacle when he put the synthesis of east and west is he my question is that is he compromised with the indian philosophical principle and he reinterpreted it and my second question is that uh, when he uh, in hindu view of life in his book hindu view of life how he justified the debate of nature and nurture which is related to the savarna marriage system in uh, hindu view of life page number 72 he explain uh, para number 2 the Uh, debate of nature and nurture the how he justify the savarna mari system it's the question of social real my two question first sir yeah uh, the first question would you uh, mind repeating uh, my dear friend the first one yes my first question is sir that uh, the you mentioned that he used the western spectral when he put the yeah. synthesis of east and west is he compromised with the indian philosophical principle and reinterpreted it my first question is that yeah yeah uh, thank you uh, mr ji for your uh, wonderful questions now uh, yeah when we, we, he has made an attempt to synthesize both indian and western uh, he has made uh, uh, a compromise now what is that compromise i feel that this is a compromise for the main reason that uh, he is trying to show that uh, he was little apologetic this is what i feel that why there is a need for uh, quoting uh, now and then in each and every page you open the indian philosophy volume in the indian philosophy volume you can see how this comes closer to bradley bosant and all that one this sort of a comparison but i feel that there is uh, the cultural difference and there is no need for us uh, to use the western methodology in order to understand indian philosophy but uh, we have to see the situation in which uh, these two books were written the christian missionaries were attacking him i mean the hindu philosophy and uh, it was uh, uh, said that indian in india there is no philosophy and the indian uh, it is full of uh, snake charmers and all that one so in order to show that we too have indian philosophy radha krishna has to defend it but i feel that in his uh, defensive approach uh, Uh, i feel that uh, he has lost uh, some uh, important uh, uh, points that we have to stand on our own legs and why this uh, western methodology while talking about indian philosophy that's why that's why uh, i don't know whether uh, i would be uh, permitted to say i used to tell uh, my students uh, that uh, uh, in order to understand uh, the western i mean indian uh, philosophy i i would say that you please read uh, um das gupta five volumes and also the outlines of indian philosophy by uh, hiriyanna uh, where that uh, presentation is, is not something which is connected to western this is what i would like to say okay, yeah this is a hindu view of life and when i was a student i was a very uh, staunch follower of radha krishnan Mm, but later of course i became a critic of radha krishnan uh, which my teacher did not like uh, and all that one and you know two of his books uh, is very fascinating one is hindu view of life and another is idealist view of life in this hindu view of life of course uh, he makes a distinction between nature and uh, nurture and here you can see i i would like to interpret this by saying that how the role of human beings uh, Uh, is something which is a uh, very important uh, in social context in fact uh, in uh, while talking about environmental philosophy also we have to apply this uh, distinction between uh, nature and uh, nurture in order to show that it has got a practical uh, orientation or practical application thank you sir thank you thank you thank you okay So all queries are solved now. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very you, much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Sir so, DJ. Uh, now uh, we are very much eager to come on the second segment of our seminar. Uh, our guest of honor, Professor M V Krishnaya. Uh, he is a former professor and head of the Department of Philosophy and Religion uh, Studies, Andhra University, Vishakhapatnam. Uh, let me give the brief introduction of Sir. Uh, he was UGC Emeritus Fellow. uh during 2013-14 in uh, anthra university he was fulbright scholar university of alabama usa 
visiting international professor uh, at Randolph Macon Women's College, Lynchburg, USA. So, sir, our students are very, very much eager to listen to you. Uh, so kindly benefit all of us with your precious words. Sir, over to Dr. M. V. Krishnaya, sir. Sir, most Thank welcome. Thank you much, Dr. M. <clears throat> sir. Thank My you, sir. To, Most welcome. My respects to all the distinguished uh, uh, personalities present in the, in the session, especially to my host, uh, the Department of Philosophy and Religion of Bangladesh uh, University, and the main speaker, Professor Panit Sarvam, Professor uh, Anand Mishraji, and Professor Gangadarji. You and uh, many others in Banaras and also in different places. We have been here already for nearly two hours. We started at 11 o'clock and it's close to 1 o'clock. And as you know that many people must be hungry and would want to have their lunch. It's natural that uh, more than philosophy, we need something for our nourishment. I'm very grateful that uh, I have been also selected to speak something in this connection, in the wonderful day of uh, so we are having one hour. So we are having one hour. So uh, no problem at all. <laughs> as we are all good. <laughs> oh, right. I, understand. So. I understand. You all have stamina to sustain yourselves maybe till the end of the day. <laughs> Thank you very much. Originally, I thought that I would speak about uh, Radha Krishna's contributions to comparative philosophy and comparative religion and complement that with uh, three important uh, contemporary Indian philosophers who were uh, his students, other Krishna students. One was Professor T.R.B. Murtiji of your department, who was also my research uh, dissertation supervisor. That's why I belong to you, to belong to Vinayas University also. The second is Professor P.T. Raju, like uh, Professor Pandisalam said, he was a Professor Radha Krishna student and he was also a mentor in our department. And also, he was mentored to Professor Sajda Murthy, the third speaker I thought I would do. Uh, then, the first two people, as I said, were his students. And uh, Sajda Murthy was not a direct student of Professor Radha Krishna. But uh, uh, the significance of taking Radha uh, Professor Sajda Murthy for this context was that uh, he has written a full fledged biography on Radha Krishna. And uh, this was published by the Ajanta publications and it's called Radha Krishnan, His Life and Ideas uh, and this was also co-authored by Professor Ashok Vokha. <clears throat> right, then I thought that I may not do the comparative philosophy and comparative religion, that will be hardcore philosophy and uh, instead I thought something flashed into my mind that and uh, which occurred very fortunately that in the early 1980s when Professor Sajidan Murthy was given an opportunity to write a, a monograph on Professor Radha Krishnan, at that time I, uh, my research work was not coming well and I was in some kind of uh, difficulty. Uh, and then Professor Murthy, I mean Professor Sajidan Murthy, kindly asked me to, to assist him in the project that he has received from the government of India to write this book on Professor Radha Krishnan. And it was, I think, I was so fortunate for uh, getting that opportunity from Professor Sajjan Murthy. I was given the task to obtain information about Radha Krishna, not on his philosophy. This is all available from his books. If you look at the biography of Professor Radha Krishna, you would see tons and tons of writing about uh, the philosophical issues by him. He said he was not interested in that kind of stuff, but something more about how this person could be reflected in other situations and in other contexts in, 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 in somewhere else. Somewhere else as in, in the field of uh, proper philosophy. So uh, himself gave me the directions what to do. He asked me to concentrate finding information from the career of Professor Radha Krishna from the time of him being the ambassador to erstwhile USSR and uh, two times vice, pre vice president of the government of India and then one time president of India. So this period, he wanted me to cover, and there were no books, and, the, and those days were much different from now, as all of you know. Uh, now it is very easy. You can Google, you can talk to somebody, you can press a button, you can get lots and lots of information. It was not that simple for me. 
and the most tough part for me was to concentrate on the newspapers of the ester years which were all you know documents put up all in a dungeon room in 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 a, in a in the library it was very dusty dark and all that it was very difficult to do that and i loved it although i thought that uh, i i may be sick from the dust and the darkness however it was a great education doing that and uh, in the course of action i had to read other works on radha krishnan one such important author was professor Ma, dr mc chagla who was once <clears throat> Ambassador in the in the to the United States of America. Oh, sorry, to in the UK. Um, so they they have given a very nice uh, anecdotes about their experience about Radha Krishnan's being the vice president or maybe some other. Then I I thought that I would concentrate because of the time constraint. I would not do all of that. Though I thought I would do the ambassador part and the twice uh, vice presidency part and one presidency part. instead i thought that it would be enough in view of the time constraint on only one part which is ambassador at moscow and professor at uh, oxford that should be adequate for this and i would i would like to do justice as much as i is possible and uh, all of you know that Ra- the life of radha krishnan was a very mysterious and miraculous life from a very ordinary humble beginnings he rose all the he rose all the way up to the first uh, first person citizen of the country prime president of the of, uh, of india we all know all these things uh, we don't know what to attribute we have been discussing about karma and all that was it his karma or what so maybe he was destined maybe he was fortunate enough to be blessed with all those positions now let us see and, and one more thing we as philosopher people also try to make a distinction if there is a, an opportunity to make a distinction we say like uh, Early Marx, later Marx, early Wittgenstein, later Wittgenstein, etc. Especially when you see some sort of paradigm shift in the thinking of the people compared to the first part or the second part. I too would like to do something with uh, Professor Radha Krishnan, but there is no such kind of paradigm shift in his teaching, thinking, right, and and writing. He continuously to be a Sanatanist. He loved to be an Indian, and he was an Indian. He was an Advaitin. He was a Hindu, and he continued that throughout. <clears throat> so then, what the distinction is for is. the first part was he was purely an academician in the second part he was an ambassador he was vice president for two times and the president of india and then there his career has come to an end and then he went back to madras his own place uh, as such the second part is connected with a, a different kind of activity but there too he did not for a minute uh, neglect the studying and writing and researching part of philosophy he continued with that he continued to do what he has been doing earlier and showed everywhere that he is a, he was a teacher and uh, he was a reader and he was a researcher now we all know that when he became a, a ambassador to uh, to moscow those were the days of a, a cold war between united states and uh, of america and and uh, and as well as soviet union uss at that time pandit nehru had deputed his sister shrimati uh, uh, lakshmi lakshmi ji lakshmi nehru lakshmi pandit vijay lakshmi pandit yes sir and uh, as an ambassador on behalf of the government of india to us to ussr so the point is that although she went there she did not uh, do very well there it was not her fault she was a, she was very good as a person and, and as, an, as an administrator but the conditions in ussr were different it was the same fate for her too like any other ambassador not being able to you know, come in contact with the big bosses of uh, soviet union go even government so she had to be shifted to uh, united states of uh, america later where she did very well then nehru had a, con- had a problem to find some other substitute and then he toyed with the idea of devdas gandhi ji and also came panikar but suddenly it came to his mind the best option would be radha krishnan as he already knew him and heard him and received something when prof radha krishnan was vice chancellor in banaras in the university he thought that he would be the right person to represent india indianness indian soul indian culture all that is indian characteristically spiritual and original and useful for the humanity and its crisis at that time so he nominated him as uh, ambassador to ussr 
then there was a lot of criticism naturally people thought that there is no place for a, a philosopher an absolute idealist in a communist country in a in a in a land of dialectical materialism there is no place for a, anything which is spiritual or anything that is a typically idealistic uh, but nehru tried to justify it saying that i did it with a specific point in my mind i would like those people to hear about india from such a person as radha krishnan who is very capable and there is no other person i can find and then he deputed him there so radha krishnan accepted it and he went as an ambassador there and he accepted that position on the condition that you would continue to have the same research and teaching uh, obligations continued with uh, the oxford university for which uh, the government and uh, nehru both accepted so when he went there like anybody else he did not immediately get the attention and audience of uh, uh, marshal stalin the head of uh, ussr at that time that was not true for radha krishnan it was true for everybody mrs uh, vijayalakshmi pandit never met him and many such ambassadors were ambassadors were in waiting to see him but for, for some un- for uh, fortunate reasons he radha krishnan has received a message that stalin wants to see him and the and the, there was a, a quick arrangement of uh, radha krishnan and uh, mr stalin and uh, they met each other and fortunately there was a friendliness and openness mutually found in each other and very soon they became a uh, lot of trust in each other and we all know that uh, as al process panisar on already mentioned about uh, stalin and he did not want to go because of course there were he has other commitments to do it and then stalin was not to be a uh, man of the iron curtain and is very tough and every and uh, he was very uh, militaristic and authoritarian uh, i we all know that so radha krishnan told stalin when he met that yours is a police state and as well as a welfare state we are not interested in your police state part of it but we are interest, interested in the welfare state point of view this kind of boldness is possible only for a philosopher not for ordinary diplomat or ordinary people who are in the service in the in the uh, emissary services of the one nation to the other nation so he did not mince words and he had the courage to sell and also in the same context he talked about to stalin about king ashoka and his uh, success and as well as failure in uh, in the kalinga part of uh, uh, north and north and south india which converted him from uh, a, a militaristic person to a saintly life so this this must have uh, influenced stalin to think about what would happen to a very powerful warrior or a powerful uh, uh, hero like, like him or anybody in the past later <clears throat> stalin said that radha krishnan is not like uh, all of, all those people he is not a narrow minded for uh, patriot uh, he is uh, in compassion uh, with the all the suffering in humanity so he saw in radha krishnan a sort of a universalistic attitude uh, not east or south or, or anything like that but as a common humanity so that must have inspired stalin to be more friendly with uh, radha krishna and uh, the second part is radha krishna style in moscow was completely undiplomatic he did not behave like a usual diplomat there like uh, many other many other diplomats from different countries he was uh, indifferent to usual conventions and uh, official dinners state banquets and he did not take part in all of that he did not say longer up to midnight no because he had an office to go to bed early and by 10 o'clock or 10 pm he would feel completely inflexible inflexible with the time and he would like to depart from there and he would make some sounds some kind of nervous tapping sounds on the table and he would recite uh, one or two shlokas from bhagavad gita and he just walks walks out of the room uh, and people would say that over oh, there goes philosopher uh, because this is unusual for them because that uh, embassy ambassadorial lifestyle was uh, the bread, bread and butter for all for all of them but not for for radha krishna he he was only doing a patriotic service for the country but uh, he was not personally gaining anything except that he was trying to uh, speak for india indian values uh, indian spirituality and indianness 
and there he was making commentaries on um, on bhagavad gita he did not waste any time and also he was known to be not present very much in the office office uh, was coming to him and he was doing everything uh, from his uh, uh, residence and he did not bother and interfere with uh, with the government activities mostly he left everything totally dem- democratic um so as as the days go by uh, the, the time came slowly uh, the, the that slowly that uh, the perception about india has changed and people begin to see that india is uh, not like what has been popularly misunderstood and also as nehru hoped uh, the view of india begin to change from the efforts of uh, professor radha krishna and uh, as such uh, professor radha krishna also tried to did not hesitate to tell stalin about uh, his uh, views about other countries and uh, other political situations uh, that boldness is only possible for somebody who really has no self that such kind of selflessness is the only uh, strength for such people to be able to talk to somebody like uh, stalin um, and he did some few good things for the soviet union in the way of uh, some help from india material material help food help etc will not go into all those details uh, and then after he is doing so very well nehru recognized nehru ji very much recognized that professor radha krishnan would be the right person to be the vice president of india look at how things changed from doing such a selfless service and an honest bold bold service uh, and then he was nominated as vice president and then he left moscow and before coming moscow it's natural for him to go say goodbye to stalin or and stalin and, and uh, uh, marshal stalin has received him with uh, much kindness and there is a lot of sadness on his face because radha krishna was leaving and he said that so you are leaving us we are sad i want you to live long i have not long to live as he said within 6 months marshal stalin expired so the the legendary convers the legendary conversations and uh, many other things associated between stalin and radha krishna are very important to speak volumes about the character personality and the philosopher who is very much thorough in the public life also he was not representing a uh india is unworldly or india is otherworldly or uh, in india is negativistic there was already a case of a, an, an excellent case of that he is the true philosopher king which uh, plato eulogized and from there he continued to be uh, in oxford and uh, he gave many lectures parling lectures and there he spoke about and started society for the study of great great religions during that time when he was there he was the one non christian philosopher or an academician to receive many distinctions in that land of uh, uh, united kingdoms and uh, there was not uh, that there uh, some people were angry and they did not like that and it's very very natural to be envy very natural to be jealous and also radha krishna would be such a great speaker and uh, i read uh, at that time Hubert Humphrey, Vice President of the United States, said after listening to him, "Who is this man? How is he able to speak English like that? Where did he study? Where did he learn this English?" These were some of the remarks made by the Vice President of the United States at that time. All that I came to know only because Sir John Mutter gave me this opportunity to work for this project, and uh, th- that material which I gathered was used in this chapter. Of course, acknowledgments were also made to testify this is true that I am not boasting anything. who you would want to see this they are all available in the book and during that time of radha krishna stay there like already professor san pandit selvam mentioned about the philosopher radha krishna book the ships volume was coming up and 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 radha krishna very politely replied that i don't want to be in the company of uh, john dewey santana whitehead g moor bertram russell ernest caser or albert stein sunstein and others that was very modest of him but ship knew that he deserved it and he justified it to his country and to his colleagues by saying that radha krishna is the living representative of the absolute idealists representing the great tradition in philosophy 
and we don't have any in our library so far so it is time and necessary to have his works and thought be represented in a book forum for for the for the posterity and that became true and he was the living bridge between east and west that is what the name he accrued in the time uh, he was a great uh, he was a is a great person to bring east and west together interpreting the great traditions and uh, uh, philosophies and uh, uh, spiritual values uh, he was also a great bridge between ancient and modern and uh, uh, modern and, and mo modern and as well as science and technology also he, he was not a uh, such an orthodox person to say or deny somewhere as we find in an in the case of other other people now he was very successful as an ambassador and we already see that we already knew it from from this and after this he was there the people in a, in a oxford they were very critical uh, we don't have to be uh, dwell on all like that uh, but he did not say one word against any of them he was very friendly very nice he was never critical he never took anything to his heart and he did his duties very carefully and the same oxford people who were not very happy with his stay there when he became the vice president of india they have accepted him as the honorary fellow of uh, all souls college oxford a very distinguished coveted position for for, for radha krishna so then he became vice president and then he, he came back to india to to, to I don't. There is a lot to say about his uh, vice president one, vice president two, and uh, and president. And there is no time for it. Instead, I would like to say a few more things. Uh, I already talked about the early Radha Krishna and later Radha Krishna. Though the early Radha, but there is the continuity and consistency in his thinking. Early, later were only about the later position, which involved his administrative positions. and he conducted himself like a philosopher king in all the in all the positions now we all we have already seen that how wonderful he was in his interaction with stalin who was so much feared in the world and today we know that there is such a person whose name most of you know that from now what is uh, what is his name uh, Kim Jong Un, the world is feared, feared of him, and uh, there is there is so much to know and read about that. And still, he is doing a lot of uh, nuclear uh, uh, adventures. We don't know why. If if there is any philosopher, ambassador like Radha Krishnan, he would have been able to go and talk to Kim Jong and try to surprise him and humanize him to accept humanity. Rather than create a uh, uh, hiatus in the in the in the human beings and and uh, communities, so there would be there is there is a place for philosopher in human situations and human societies, and philosophy is very useful and Indian philosophy is very this worldly and world affirming and uh, world loving. Uh, the 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 next point is. Uh, we are all philosophy students and uh, this lecture is also meant for the students and most students i would like to recommend to students to take philosophy seriously and concentrate on uh, civils and uh, try to become ifs officers indian foreign service officers and uh, try to occupy that particular area of uh, uh, international activity so that philosophy can be represented i mean india can be represented indian spirituality indian values can be represented and through us and our leadership we will be able to use uh, uh, the philosophy and uh, bring common humanity with a philosophical bent of mind uh, with that uh, i take leave and uh, i i am very grateful for all of you for listening i know there are many friends whose name i could not take but i know that they are there i'm grateful for all of you thank you so thank you very much thank you very much wonderfully interpreted radha krishnan's philosophy in a social political perspective as well and uh, give suggestions to students how they can flourish philosophy on international platform too
so today when we are having so many resources of uh, informations like uh, uh, tv computers internet different types of apps and access to it therefore our superficial mind may be in illusion that what is the use of a teacher what is the role of a teacher when we are having so many resources of uh, information but uh, i think that uh, for the character building of a child for the personality formation of a student the role of a teacher is inevitable i just want to mention an uh, example of maharshi valmiki that a robber or a cat can be, become a maharshi valmiki but it's not possible through explosion of information it is possible only through that human touch which comes from a in existence thank you very much sir so without any delay uh, i would like to uh, come on the next segment of our uh, seminar our seminar is going to be presided by professor d a gangadhar uh, dr d a gangadhar he had written even a book on dr sarvapalli radhakrishnan uh, on uh, philosophy and uh, brahmacharya on modern logic and uh, so many lectures and uh, papers had been uh, published and delivered by uh, professor d a gangadhar on philosophy of religion aur uh, ab sir jo hai wo researchers ko help karte hain aur he was uh, visiting professor of gurunanak university amritsar also so i would like to call upon aur hame सर ने पढ़ाया है पीजी के दौरान सर से आशीर्वाद हमें मिलता रहा है आज भी मिलता है लेकिन तब साक्षात उनका आशीर्वाद प्राप्त होता था और मैं मंत्र चाहती हूँ सर को कि वो डॉक्टर राधाकृष्ण पर उनका बहुत ही विशद अध्ययन है और अपने शब्दों से हमारे समस्त विद्यार्थियों को और हम सब को लाभान्वित करें डॉक्टर जी गंगाधर सर okay thank you dr shruti my beloved daughter and student both thank you very much am i audible properly am i audible absolutely absolutely ah, okay we have this morning listened two great scholars krishnaya and dr paneer selvam and especially paneer selvam he has given very nicely but thought provoking also the journey of professor radha krishnan in philosophy but also i can say little bit that whatever radha krishnan said was discussed here thoughtful provoking thoughtful but to me personally because i have visited dr radha krishnan's house around 70 along with my teacher professor shobharani basu and in that journey <laughs> also i visited the mother holy mother of shri arvindo ashram so that too gave me some inspiration dr radha krishnan and mother i would say that before remarking the two scholars i should say that everybody has spoken philosophy side more but some of the questions raised by our students rajan and rajneesh and they are very helpful to me particularly because i know that radha krishnan contribution to philosophy of religion for radha krishnan the religion was in different ways so he tried to be very liberal to all religions and wrote fellowship of faiths but became a very good scholar of comparative religion because nobody like to know what is comparative religion comparative religion is not a method but is a way to enter into the crux of all religions and a objective understanding of religion before him max muller tried to give give a science of religion this that was the year that was the age when people were interested how to 
to understand religion. So Radha Krishnan, even Max Muller himself suggested that it be comparative religion. Comparative religion is does, does not mean comparison of religions. No, comparison is always bad. No comparison to any religion. But comparative religion is an objective understanding because people are confused that it is comparing religions. No, it is an objective understanding of religions. So his book, Religion and Eastern Religion and Western Thought book, which has been given reference by both, are very is very important. And the first chapter, which I would like to present here before the two scholars or young students, that the first chapter even is enough to know what is the difference between religion and spirituality. He began with the lecture, his lecture that the word unborn soul. What is this unborn soul? He says there is the situation in the world to start with humanism. Humanism to go against religion. In August Comte tried there and many Greek thinkers, Protagoras and so many started this, uh, given this idea. But Radha Krishna has suggested in his own way, a new way, that comparative religion as an objective study of religions and should be uh, treated like that, objective, going to, into the crux of the religions. Now he has given what a very wonderful idea regarding humanism that keeping everything away, I should interpret we should, one should interpret comparative religion as the method for spiritualization of religions. There is difference between spiritualization and religion. There are various religions, but spirituality is only one. So this essence of religion has to be given more importance to other philosophical attitude of Dr. Radha Krishna. Uh, he has uh, given uh, Paneer Silvamji my friend, brother friend, Paneer Senwalji, the Secretary General of IPC, he is very close to me and he has given a very serious mind to the philosophy of Radha Krishna. But something is missing as for me, I looked that religion portion is not given importance. So this comparative study of religion, which is very important for to study the religions in all the institutions and here in philosophy department there is the provision for uh, reading comparative religion so i am very happy that this through this comparative study of religion the spiritualization of religion the spiritualized humanism he has given this idea new idea spiritualized humanism and what is this spiritualized humanism? That every human being has been given his life as a gift from some supernatural reality. Brahman maybe, maybe Logos, maybe something, Shabda, Shiva, like that. But uh, humanism in here, in this department, in the philosophy department of Banaras and University, Professor N. K. Devaraj. He has written a very good book on philosophy of culture. He has given the idea of creative humanism. So everybody wonders what is this creative humanism? He has opened the way to understand, to go into deep uh, to the various aspects of humanism. He said that even uh, um, novel, stories, poetry, art, everything, skills, development, all this is uh, the way to uh, evolve creativity in the man. And if we become creative, we can understand everything. Uh, creativity doesn't mean only critic criticism. Criticism is something else. But without criticizing, one should understand properly everything. So I must uh, congratulate uh, Professor Sapanir Selvam for giving his, his uh, wonderful ideas 
journey from philosophy, but he should also have been given this importance. Uh, I should uh, confine myself to some of the questions raised by uh, our students. Uh, Rahul, this was the missing point in Anir um, Selvam's talk uh, because he has not given long discourse because it's very difficult to uh, concise everything in within an hour. Sarva Mukti, social salvation. And what is this social salvation? It is not only Mukti from bondage of life. Bondage is also of various kinds, suffering, and this and that by language, by many, in many ways, whatever you like to interpret, you can say that it is uh, Mukti, fear, freedom from fear, freedom from violence, freedom from all sorts of suffering which gives man uh, to be dis disappointed with his life. So all these things have been given by uh, even Rahul, uh, Rahulji that he should uh, understand what is this Saramukti in a proper sense. And Rajan, <laughs> I have given already that is specialized humanism. So he, I think he must be uh, ha happy to know. Krishnayaji has also given in his own way because he, he is the student of uh, religion also. I know, I know very much. He's very good, good friend of mine. So with these uh, words, I, I, I should uh, end this presiding religion, like <laughs> ceremony uh, to this conference, to this teacher's day. Why? Because we should be proud of being a teacher. Dr. Radha Krishnan has given us the opportunity and many of his students approached when he approached him so that we, we, that we want to celebrate your birthday. Radha Krishnan refused and said, if you want to celebrate, you should say it teacher's day. So with this idea, I am very much well overwhelmed that he has given the idea of um, um, this, uh, what, what I said, this Sarva Mukti and this and that, and Teacher's Day, importance of Teacher's Day. So all the teachers of the world should be proud of because of Radha Krishna's thought contributions given him. Whatever may be, there are a lot of things to be discussed, but it is very difficult to uh, some things have been written in the books. So several books have come. And even the Radha Krishna's book is enough to know him. I have also written a very little small uh, monograph of Dr. Radha Krishna. So I must thank everybody, including our head of department, Professor Ananda Mishra, who has also been my student, dear student, and very humble and very active man also. I must remember the other members of the department, and I, I should say namaskar to everybody and pay regards to everybody. Shruti is always with us, and uh, um, there are so many uh, scholars here, so I, I will not be able to name them because it will, it will take a lot of time. I must also thank the office bearers and the persons Knowing in the offices like Dr. Sanjay, Niraj, Babai Mishra, <laughs> Babai Mishra, Babai Ram. So I am very happy with my that I have come back to my own home. And I feel like that I mean, they're sitting in the seminar hall where you are, everybody is sitting here and doing everything. So I must thank everybody with, uh, with the core of my heart and come with all the congratulations to everybody, especially Shruti, Anandji, and many others who might name. Uh, maybe I, may, may I might have left some more names, but I am not uh, naming it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Shruti. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for coming again here on the Dice of the Department of Philosophy and Religion. Beat you all, though, in a virtual mode.
but uh, we are uh, overwhelmed we are very happy to have all of you here in our department and before i conclude and uh, before we go for formal vote of thanks i would like to request all of you that whenever we uh, come to you with the uh, request of coming here uh, you will not deny you will come here again and again thank you very much sir and uh, before we uh, conclude our session i would like to call upon uh, dr priyanka mishra a young assistant professor she has just joined our department for formal vote of thanks over to dr priyanka mishra Uh, thank you so much, Shruti, ma'am. Uh, myself is Priyanka Mishra, and I'm extremely proud to have uh, this opportunity to give a vote of thanks on behalf of Department of Philosophy and Religion. Uh, so, first, I would like to give uh, uh, my, uh, first. I would like to express my profound gratitude to our guest of honor, uh, Dr. M. V. Krishnanaya, sir, uh, for sharing his thought on. on the life journey of uh, s radha dr s radha krishnan and how he represented india and indian spirituality worldwide thank, thank you so much sir for joining us today and uh, next i would like to uh, thank the speaker of the day uh, of course the dr s panit selvam sir for uh, his enlightening uh, lecture on uh, this philosophical journey of dr s radha krishnan and his contribution to contemporary is in the contemporary indian philosophy and he in his lecture we also learned that how to contextualize uh, radha krishnan's thought uh, and his ideas you know uh, when we are doing some research or when we no so thank you so much sir for joining us today and next i would like to thank uh, uh, my get uh, i would like to thank our uh, chairman of the session uh professor d a ganga das sir for your memorable and you know stimulating remark uh, your presence here uh, definitely enriches this in event sir and i'm also your student uh, <laughs> you taught me uh, in the department uh, next i would like to uh, thank you our head of the department professor anand mishra sir for his support guidance and taking effort to make this saturday seminar journey possible so thank you so much sir and next i would like to thank all the distinguished faculty member from our department and from other university uh, i would like to name some of uh, professors here so you know uh, first i would like to name professor m r mehta sir s p pandey sir r k jha sir durgesh choudhary sir pramod bagde sir baleshwar yadav sir and uh, vivek pandey sir professor gopal sahu sir ambika das sharma sir alok tandon sir d n tiwari sir jayan sir professor jata shankar sir and uh, uh ranjit ghosh sir and you know uh, dr kalpana dr neeti dr rahul dr rajiva so thank you so much to all of you for joining us today and for this uh, we remain grateful and finally a big thanks to our student and research scholar for their active participations and making the seminar more productive so uh, now i would end my speech here thank you and yeah sorry if i forget yeah and i would uh, also appreciate our convener dr shruti mishra for organizing such a wonderful and intellectual discussion thank you so much ma'am and uh, now i would like to end you now i over to dr shruti ma'am thank you so much ma'am thank you so much thank you so much all of you uh, sir meet you again all of you and see you soon sir thank you very much hope it is over now.